John chapter 13, as we continue the series, Christian Essentials, we just began it, um, but we continue it, Apostasy and Grace. Now, we've all heard of someone, perhaps uh, someone you knew personally, who appeared to be a Christian, Uh, maybe someone you knew at church even, or someone you used to listen to perhaps on the radio or television or whatever, but someone who seemed to believe in Christ sincerely, but who then turned from Christ and from the church. Most of us have had that experience, whether or not personally we know it, it has happened. And unfortunately, many don't seem to realize that Jesus told us to expect this to happen. So it causes confusion among believers Sometimes we don't know what to say when unbelievers bring up examples in criticism of the church. The word for what I'm describing is apostasy, a turning from, a falling from. Scripture speaks of it this way. Now listen carefully because I'm going to get to a definition of it that I think is extremely important in our understanding of Bible doctrine. But in Hebrews 3.12... You have this statement, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. In Hebrews 6, a little later, uh, verse 4 and following, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God, the language is very careful there. Uh, to say they've been close to it and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. And the word translated falling or falls away in those passages is the word that apostasy is derived from. It, It is one's, here's the definition, it is one's withdrawal from one's desertion from following Christ and instead of confessing Christ, coming to the place where they deny Christ. Now don't stop listening because there's a very important point I'm going to make in just a moment. Causes in Scripture include persecution, false teaching uh, that would lead someone to say, oh, I don't believe this anymore. Persecution, it would be fear. Uh, I don't I don't want to be a part of this. Uh, Temptation. uh, I'd rather live my life this way. Uh, Worldliness, same thing along with that. Um, It it could be defective knowledge of Christ and and thus the misunderstandings that are a part of that lead one to just not care as much. It could be some moral lapse in the life and, and, uh, and they just are undone. Forsaking of worship, we see that when... When people do forsake worship, it leads to, um, can lead someone to just give it up. And just coming to that place of unbelief. These are all things that are mentioned in in the scriptures as being tied to those who are no longer a part of uh, the church. Scripture shows an awareness of its existence. Listen to some other passages. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 15. For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. Do we have these scriptures on the, uh, the outline, by the way? Just, just so you can write them down. I don't want to um, go too quickly. For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. Jude 1.4, certain pieces, persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were, listen, long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. So God is not unaware of their turning from. Uh, ungodly persons who turn the grace of God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 2.19, they went out from us because they were not really of us. That's an important verse for our understanding. For if they had been of us, John writes, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. We'll come back to that in a second when I answer the question, who are apostates? 
we are to expect it in the future. Jesus spoke of it. Matthew 24, then they will deliver you to tribulation, talking about the end times, and will kill you, those alive at that time who were following Christ, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name, and at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. The day of the Lord is said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, that it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And then 1 Timothy 4, 1, one more passage. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith. So again, in the latter times, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. So it's important to get it right, the answer to the question, who are apostates? And I believe this is correct. Apostates are people who gave the appearance of conversion but had never been born again, and then, for the different reasons that we talked about, turned from following Christ. The reason for this topic, you probably have guessed, is that at the table, in the upper room, there was one who was deserting Jesus, Judas Iscariot. At the same time, There were 11 others who later that night would struggle but would not desert Jesus. What was the difference? Well, the difference was the grace of God. Yes, Judas made a decision to betray Jesus, but we are told specifically in the Scripture that the grace of God is the difference. And we see truth about Jesus, Judas' apostasy, and as we see that, uh, I pray, believers, that you will celebrate the grace of God in your life. Number one, apostates are known by Jesus. Verse 18, they're at the table, and he says, I do not, Jesus says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. Now, Jesus had chosen all 12, that's true, earlier in his ministry, to join him as disciples. That word choice can be used in different, uh, different uh, times to mean something other than chosen for salvation. But he did choose them to join him as disciples. But here in verse 18, Jesus is speaking of those chosen for eternity to be a part of his kingdom, to be the nucleus of the New Testament church. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I've chosen. I know the 11. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled, he continues. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. The picture there is of a horse lifting up its hoof to kick. I've never experienced that. I have very little experience with horses. I've had them kick when I rode them, but not been behind them, thankfully. Jesus knew that the occurrence mentioned by David in Psalm 41, 9, which he quotes in verse 18. He knew that that was a prophecy of the one who would betray him and that the time of its fulfillment had had come. And as the narrative shows, Jesus also knew that this one was Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve sitting around the table one of his disciples, one who had served with him. Today, when someone turns from apparent faith in Christ, it does not surprise Jesus. Apostates are known by him, as this text shows us. So let us remember that Jesus knows his sheep true followers by the grace of God. I think of John 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own. That gives me comfort. My own know me. Because I believe, and I hope you can say, that you are one of the sheep. One of those that is a true believer. One who will not be an apostate, even if persecution were to hit our land tomorrow we would stand firm with Christ. He knows, and it's by his grace 
that we are one of his sheep. Secondly, apostasy confirms the person of Christ. Verse 19, let me show you how. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. He is supplied. Literally, the verse says that you may believe I am. Jesus is saying you will see the betrayal of one of you, you will see that as fulfilled prophecy. My telling you this beforehand is evidence that I am, that I am the Messiah, that I am the Son of God, that I am, meaning I am God. I am equal with God the Father. Judas apostasy and apostasy when it happens today and when it happens in the end times doesn't argue against the truth of God's word. Please understand that. It confirms the truth of God's word, for the scripture predicts it will occur. Jesus predicted that Judas Iscariot would betray him, but he also predicts that there would be others who would betray him, particularly in the end times. So when it occurs, it is a confirmation that Jesus prophesied accurately. Indeed, God is gracious, I believe, to strengthen our faith through the fulfillment of all that he says. And as we are participating in this upper room discourse through the text, we should be encouraged that Jesus knew who it was. We'll see that. He points uh, the person out in the following uh, text. We'll get to it. But the third point, the apostasy of one does not invalidate the ministry of the others. Verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Uh, Notice, what happens with Judas, what happens this night, does not ruin ministry for the rest of the disciples. The 11 would still be sent. Jesus is proclaiming that in verse 20. They will wonder, what happens to us now? Uh, They would remember this word. The 11 would still be sent, beginning from Jerusalem, as ambassadors of Christ, who uh, uh, himself represented God the Father. So they are ambassadors. And where they went, they were to be received as messengers, ambassadors from someone higher than them, from Christ, from God. By God's grace, the person and work uh, of Christ, the truth of the gospel was confirmed through the apostles preaching. It says in Hebrews 2, 4, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit. The apostasy of Judas did not invalidate the ministry of the others. Uh, They continued on. The book of Acts shows forth that they continued on and that God confirmed that they indeed were his ambassadors. Fourthly, Jesus is grieved by apostasy. When Jesus had said this, verse 21, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. One of you will not carry on the work. One of you doesn't believe in me. One of you will help set up the crucifixion. I want you to realize from verse 21, Jesus was not unaffected by this. He became troubled in spirit. He became grieved. And we see this response in a, similar, in a similar way, in John 11, at his friend Lazarus' death. In other words, he grieves there too. When Jesus therefore saw, uh, <clears throat> I think it was Mary weeping, John 11:33 says, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. A little further down, we, we have the verse, Jesus wept. See, I want you to realize that Jesus perfectly uh, followed the Father's will, but he did so with real human emotion. 
It wasn't a weakness. It was a part of who he was. Judas' apostasy grieved him. And and I would say that Jesus' personal knowledge of the hardships of a sin-tarnished world and sinful people in it make him a gracious high priest at the throne of God. We're told that in Hebrews 4. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. No, he is is a more compassionate high priest. He is a a more understanding because he is the God-man and dealt with humanity as a part, not in weakness, but in the strength and grieving and... uh, um, Emotions of sadness are part of what he felt, and he felt that toward Judas. He's not just going through the motions of getting to the cross. It affected him. It affects us if we know someone who turns their back upon the Lord. It affects us deeply. We're burdened by that, grieved by that. Number five, apostates may not be recognized by believers. God knows them. Jesus knows them, but we may not recognize them. In verse 22, the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. You might have thought, oh, they're going to turn. Everybody's going to look at Judas. Wouldn't that be uncomfortable? But they didn't. In fact, the other gospels say they were, could it be I? You know, they were wondering, who is this? They had no clue that it was Judas. He had served alongside them for over two years. He had not expressed any doubts or misgivings that anyone would have doubted his allegiance to Jesus. Verse 23 says there was reclining on Jesus' bosom, his chest, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him. Uh, We certainly believe with some confidence that this is John, the apostle who's writing this. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, tell us who it is whom he is speaking. Find out for us. And he, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Verse 26, Jesus then answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. It's noted that Jesus identifies his betrayer, Uh, with what seems to be a kind gesture, perhaps to say to Judas, uh, you will betray one who has always extended kindness to you. Oh, that we as his church, his representatives, would learn to demonstrate that principle. Jesus calls us to graciously love our enemies and any who become our enemies and to pray for them not to hold bitterness or resentment. Number six, apostates are under Satan's influence. After the morsel, Satan entered into him. Satan, as a fallen angel, a demon, personally possessed Judas, came inside, began to control him, uh, filling him, with a desire now to carry out the betrayal. Now, by God's grace, that cannot, what we read here, Satan entering into him, that cannot happen to a believer. So let me digress and just make sure your understanding of that. John MacArthur says it well. There is no clear example in the Bible where a demon ever inhabited or invaded a true believer. Never in the New Testament epistles are believers warned about the possibility of being inhabited by demons. Neither do we see anyone rebuking, binding, or casting demons out of a true believer. The epistles never instruct believers to cast out demons, whether from a believer or unbeliever. Christ and the apostles were the ones who cast out demons, and in every instance, the demon-possessed people were unbelievers. Some of them became believers after the demon was cast out, I would say. 
The collective teaching of Scripture, he writes, is that demons can never spatially invade a true believer. A clear implication of 2 Corinthians 6, for example, is that the indwelling Holy Spirit could never cohabit with demons. That text says, What harmony has Christ with Belial, the devil? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. In Colossians 1.13, Paul says, God delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. MacArthur concludes, salvation brings true deliverance and protection from Satan. Number seven. Apostates do not frustrate the plans of God. Verse 27 continues. Therefore Jesus said to him, to Judas, what you do, do quickly. You see, Jesus knew that Judas' apostasy and betrayal was part of what Peter would call in his Acts sermon, the predetermined plan of God. So knowing that the hour was at hand, Jesus spoke no angry word, no plea to stop the betrayal, but he spoke with an understanding of and a trust in God's will. Listen, look at verse 27. Jesus sets the crucifixion in motion. Understand that. And it seems he had spoken so calmly to Judas that the disciples thought he was directing some ordinary business. Look at what we read next. No one, no one of those who was reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him, to Judas. For some were supposing because Judas had the money box that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. And it was under the cover of night that Judas would later lead a Roman cohort from the chief priests and Pharisees to a place he knew well because Jesus often met with his disciples there when they were in Jerusalem. And there uh, these soldiers would arrest Jesus. But think about it. This was God's gracious plan. Jesus sets it into motion. God's gracious plan to offer forgiveness through the death of Jesus. And so apostates do not frustrate the plans of God. We say that by faith looking at this passage of scripture, but we also say that by faith thinking of things from any current events you've known about in your life and reputation thrown upon the church because this or that one has left the ministry or been unfaithful to Christ or thinking of the future. No, uh, apostates do not frustrate the plans of God. Implications, how should we respond to this passage and to apostasy? Let's just put it that way. Well, we, we should admit its existence, okay? It is someone who in appearance was a believer, but who was not truly born again. Please understand that. That's our understanding of Scripture. Uh, from, from putting verses side by side, I come to that conclusion. I believe it's the right one. I, I do recognize there are people who do believe um, within uh, Christianity, believe you can lose your salvation. I'm not one of those. Southern Baptists, uh, by and large, and certainly in our statement of faith, are not uh, of that category. So we admit its existence, understanding what it is. We secondly point out that God's word predicts it and more of it in the very last days. Number three, we, we should let it be a warning to, as Peter exhorts in 2 Peter 1.10, make certain about his calling and choosing you. It's a great passage. We might look at that next Sunday night. Uh, it was to be last week's evening message. So we'll see. But make certain about his calling and choosing you. So, so we should be warned to do that, to be certain of our salvation. 
And fourth, we should understand its nature. Apostates turn from Christ because they were never born again. And some circumstance, whether it be persecution or disappointment in, in uh, leader, whatever it is, it causes them to turn from Christ. So listen, here's something practical. The next time someone uses apostasy, that is this or that one used to follow Christ, they don't anymore, and they use that to criticize the church, humbly and lovingly point out that, well, first of all, we are judged not by what this or that person does with the truth. We are judged by what we do with the truth. Turn the conversation to, to make the person think about, what have you done with Jesus? This, here's what this person did. They, they look like they followed for a while, but then didn't. But what have you done with the truth? The next time you hear of someone turning away from Christ, Grieve, certainly. Uh, Be assured. Make your calling and election sure, certainly. Thank God for his grace to keep you in Christ. In your heart, have the humility to, to say and to really mean, except for the grace of God, there go I. And at the same time, understand, Jesus told us to expect. It's being fulfilled. His word is is proven to be true. So it makes us humble. It makes us uh, grieved, for sure. But it also keeps us from being helpless in the criticism concerning those who used to follow who don't follow anymore. What do you say about that? Well... Jesus told us to expect it. I grieve over it, but he told us to expect it. It doesn't take away the truth of who he is and the truth of salvation in him. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, I would ask, Lord, that you would bless through these truths. We thank you for the amazing picture of your sovereignty and Jesus recognizing that who Judas was and what he was to do and setting that into motion, showing his commitment to the cross. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you that we understand. You've brought us to understand the gospel. You've brought us to understand the need for a Savior, one who would take your wrath on our behalf, that we could be set free from the penalty of sin. So we thank you for Jesus' death upon the cross. We, we even thank you, even though it grieves us too, that you used uh, Judas in accomplishing this. We just thank you that everything went perfectly according to your will. Father, we pray that you would give us opportunity to, to speak to someone this week about these, about the importance of the gospel to their life. And if we know of anyone who has used the excuse of people falling away, perhaps you would urge us to reconnect with that individual. Well, Father, we pray uh, that you would penetrate into the hearts of people who are here this morning who need to be convicted. And we can't do it, Lord, so we pray for you to convict of sin and righteousness, judgment to come. We pray for that work of the Holy Spirit and that you would draw souls to Christ. In Jesus' name.